Well, shalom and God bless you as we uh, continue again our study of discipleship. This is what we've been studying for a long time now, but it's one of the most foundational and important aspects of our life as a follower of Jesus Christ. We are to learn his ways, adapt his mannerisms, his, his way that he presented himself. He set us the example and we are the ones that are supposed to follow him. So as it says in Galatians chapter five, that we are known by our fruit and that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> there are nine parts to the fruit and it's love, joy, peace, etc. So we've been looking at what it means to be known by our fruit because Again, as we looked at John 15, 8, Jesus said, when you produce fruit or much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. So bringing forth fruit would be making disciples, certainly, to bring other people to the Lord and to disciple them and teach and instruct them on what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But also on the there's another aspect to it and that's an in, internal modeling that we have or um, the qualities in our lives that would represent that we are true disciples. We can't make disciples if people do not respect us, if they don't like us, if they don't think that we have integrity, or if, that, if we're mean-spirited, uh, if we're not living out the principles that Jesus set forth for us, then we certainly can't be a, a very good example to others. And they'd say, well, if that's what it if that what it if that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ then I don't want to be like that so we have to examine ourselves you know how is our soul where are we are we truly being followers of Jesus Christ each and every day in all of our actions and all of our attitudes and so we were looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and the first one that's on the list is love. And so we began last time defining the definition of love and saying it's not an emotion, but it's our um, inner attitude. It's what's inside of our spirit. And so the first thing that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as he is defining what love is, he says that love is patient. And so we have to understand, well, what does it mean to be patient? A lot of us, we say, well, I want patience and I want it now. But when you, patience means that you have to wait. You have to, as we said before, we have to pace ourselves. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Sometimes it's translated as let us run with patience the race God has set before us. Patience is endurance. And I remember when I was in high school playing basketball and we would of course, we would practice uh, for an hour and a half or two hours. I don't know. I forget how long we, we practice. But at the end of our practice, the coach would then say, all right, let's do laps. And we'd have to do 20 laps around the gym after we'd already practiced for an hour and a half or two. And the reason was that we had to build up our endurance our perseverance, our patience, our stamina, if you will. 
because when you're playing in a game and you're playing and there's a lot of stress and intensity and a lot of physical effort, it takes a lot out of you. So you have to build up your stamina. You have to build up your endurance. And the same is true in our spiritual life as well, is that we have to learn how to build up our endurance, our stamina. Paul wrote to who he called his son in the Lord, to Timothy, he said to him, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. So the apostle Paul, at one point, he said, I have learned in all things to be content. He learned this. This is part of his endurance, that he learned how to endure hardship. You know, when I, for a while, just for maybe four months or so, I worked at Dick Brooks Honda selling cars, and I never sold cars before. And uh, we had a sales manager that was a type A personality. I mean, he was, he would jump on you at the drop of a hat. He would chew you out and he didn't discriminate. He did it to all of us. And you'd hear him get on the uh, intercom and he'd say, Nancy, come to the sales desk right now. You know, and then he'd chew me out or, or whoever he called to the sales desk uh, to tell me that you know, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I remember, but you know, a lot of times what he was chewing you out for was not really true. For example, one evening, it's about, it was getting close to five o'clock and some of us salespeople were out on the patio in front of the sales um, showcase and, uh, outside and and we were just talking and there was a customer it wasn't my customer but he just came up to me and said he asked me what a particular color looked like <clears throat> and i just pointed down uh to the uh cars in the parking lot there and i i said you see that one down yonder well that's that's the color and he says oh okay and then later this sales manager came out and he started chewing me out and he said <clears throat> that I was not to speak to anybody else's customer and that um, what I was doing was we didn't have that particular color in the type of vehicle that he wanted. And what that would mean is that we would have to uh, find one at another location and bring it in. And this salesperson was upset about this and uh, he was blaming me and all I did was answer a question that a customer was asking and uh, evidently one of the other sales guys told the manager the situation and he later apologized I was walking by him and I I wasn't talking to him he was standing there with another manager and and I was just walking by and he says, he, he apologized, but he said, I'm just trying to make you tough. I'm just trying to make you tough. And so he, he thought that it was necessary for me to be tough. Well, you know, we don't need to be wimps. That's for sure. We don't need to just cave in at the first time that somebody looks at us wrong or some the first time that somebody criticizes us if you're in ministry you're going to receive criticism you're you're going to receive opposition look at Jesus's life what happened with him he would go into the synagogues and what would happen there would be those that were angry with him angry to the point that they wanted to kill him 
So it's really satanic. You know, you you will be attacked by the enemy. You know, Paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the, uh, you know, those in high positions in the spiritual realm. We're not really wrestling against that individual. Our enemy, our real enemy, is Satan. And he's going to use any and every way that he can to discourage us, to dishearten us, to make us want to give up. I was listening to Andrew Womack, and he had uh, been in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, the sergeants, when he went through training, the sergeants would just do all kinds of things, you know, to, uh, you know, anything that a person did, you know, they would say, no, that's not good enough. You need to undo that and do it over. And they were just real nitpicky and, and they were sometimes just mean, you know, or, or hateful. And Andrew asked one of the sergeants, I think it was, when they were just alone and he said, why do you do this? And the sergeant said, look, son, we're sending you over there and you're going to be risking your lives. We're trying to toughen you up. And so, you know, sometimes we have to know how to endure the hardships like a good soldier. You have to realize that it's not always going to be easy or comfortable or pleasant. Sometimes we try to present following Jesus as, oh, if you come to Jesus, everything will be just fine. Everything will be glorious. Everything will be great. It'll be wonderful. And coming to Jesus and receiving him into your heart is wonderful. But that does not exclude us from the hardships that will come our way. And so we have to be trained how to endure these hardships because number one we have to realize that they are going to come so we shouldn't be surprised or caught off guard by it and we have to develop a way to handle it when those hardships come remember David where there was a situation where he was running from King Saul and he went into enemy territory and he was going to go with the Philistines to battle against Israel. But the commander said, well, you know, my superior officers, they don't want you going, so you need to go back to Ziglag. That's where they were staying in Philistine territory. And David said, well, what have I done? What have I done? And the officer said, well, you haven't done anything as far, as far as I'm concerned, but my superior officers do not want you going. So he went back to Ziglag, and when they got back, he and his men, they found that their wives and all their possessions had been stolen while they, while they were gone. And so... David's men and David himself were so distraught over this. And even David's men were turning against David, blaming David for what had happened. But the scripture says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. So when we go through these hardships and these difficulties, we need to know how to encourage ourselves in the Lord in those hard times. Here is David, a psalm of David, and he's just putting pen to paper the things that he's experiencing, the emotions that he's feeling. And sometimes that's a good remedy to put it down on paper. And here he's saying, How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long shall I counsel, take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And you would think that this was the time that King Saul was so insanely jealous of David and his success and his anointing by the Holy Spirit that King Saul chase David down like a criminal. David had to live like a fugitive. He had to live in the rocks and caves and anywhere where he could find a stronghold, a place where he could hide so that King Saul wouldn't find him. And But, you know, after a while, it was just grating on David, how long is this going to last? Because he hadn't done anything wrong. You know, if you'd done something wrong, that would be one thing, but to know that you hadn't done anything wrong and you're still being persecuted, then you have to wonder, how long is this going to, to keep on going? And sometimes we go through difficulties and hardships and we're wondering, how long is this going to last? How long am I going to have to endure this? And so, just like, you know, the scripture says that we are to endure hardship. We have to learn this, that we have to run our race with endurance or patience. We have to learn how to pace ourselves. And we have to learn that this too will pass. But we don't know how long. It may be a day. It may be a week. It may be months. It may be years. But this too will pass. There will come a time. You know, there's a time and season for all things. But we have to learn how to uh, endure these pressures and stresses and disappointments and discouragement and situations that come against us. We have to learn how to endure these things with patience, with endurance. And in Psalm 13, it also says that God has not forgotten you. Sometimes we may feel like, well, God, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm going through all this? Jesus hanging on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was quoting Psalm 22 when he said that. But there are times when we do feel forsaken by God. But the scripture, we have to hang on to the scripture that says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He is always there. And if we don't feel his presence, it's not God that has removed himself from us, but it's us who has allowed our hardships and our difficulties and our trials to get our mind and our focus off of God. We focus more in on what we're dealing with and what we're what our situation is then we're focused in on God and we have to know how to counter this how to encourage ourselves in the Lord so David continues in Psalm 13 but I trust in your unfailing love a love that will never disappoint never give up it will never go away. It is steadfast. It never fails. So David had to remind himself of this. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. So here was how David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. My heart rejoices in your salvation. 
So Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't think it's strange. Don't think that you're the only one that has ever experienced this. You're not. But that's what the enemy wants us to think, that we're the only one. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't love you. You're going through this fiery ordeal, and I don't know why you've done something. God's ticked off with you. He's angry with you. He's bringing these things on you. That's the ploy of the enemy to discourage us, to dishearten us. But Peter says, don't think it's strange or surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you as though it's something strange were happening to you. It's not. This is part of the human experience. Even Jesus, we talked about it, even Jesus went through the fiery trial. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat great drops of blood, praying that God would remove the cup of taking on the sins of the world upon his shoulders and to be separated from God because that's the only thing that can uh, separate us from God is sin. But Jesus has paid the price for our sin. So we don't have to bear our sin anymore. Jesus bore it for us. So we're not separated from God. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We have to realize again that the psalmist said in Psalm 30 verse 5, weeping may endure for a night. You may cry your eyes out. You may weep until you, you just uh, cannot control that weeping. You're heaving. You can't stop it. It's uncontrollable. I mean, you're just weeping out of control, and it may endure for the night. It may endure in the darkness. It may endure during that time of trial that you're going through. There may be weeping. But the psalmist said, but joy comes in the morning when the darkness leaves. When you go through that trial, he says, that's when the joy pops out. Joy comes in the morning. So don't stop in the middle of the night when you're weeping uncontrollably. It may endure for the entire time of darkness that you're facing. But know that this season of your life will end. Joy will come in the morning. And we look at Nehemiah and what he said to the Hebrew people who had come back out of exile, who had been in foreign land in Babylon, in the Babylonian Empire. They had been exiled from their own country, their own land, their own inheritance. But now they have come back to rebuild. And once they rebuild the wall and they rebuild the temple, even though it's not as magnanimous, uh, you know, it may not be as spectacular as Solomon's temple, yet it's a start. Yet it's the beginning point. And so the people are weeping because they know that it's not the, exactly the way it was when Solomon, when David and when Solomon were reigning. But here is Nehemiah telling the people, you know, you, we need, this is a holy day. We've completed this project. God has helped us. We need to send gifts to one another of food. And he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, if the enemy can rob you of your joy, then you become weak and powerless. 
we have to encourage ourselves in the Lord, get that joy back in the midst of our trial. What did Paul and Silas do in a prison cell in Philippi? They were singing hymns to God at the midnight hour in the darkness. And that's why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here is Paul's remedy for when we're in the darkness, when we're in, when weeping is enduring for the night, when we're in those dark places, when we're in those fiery trials, that we're to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God the Father for everything in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So put on those CDs and start singing. Put on those worship music and, and just speak to uh, get the Psalms out and start quoting those Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. We need to get those Psalms out and start speaking those and, and thinking about those hymns of the church. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And those spiritual songs, we're to speak those and then we're to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. This is our defense against those fiery trials when we're going through those difficulties. That's what Paul and Silas did in a prison cell. They were singing hymns to the Lord at the midnight hour. When they were hurting, when they had been beaten, when they had been chained, when they had been put in the stock, in the dungeon, there in Philippi, that's what they did. And it broke the chains in their hearts. It broke the the heaviness, the depression that they could have experienced. Some, you know, somebody asked me, said, do you ever get depressed? Do you ever get depressed? Well, you know, if I listened to the world, yeah, I, I would. Uh, and if I dwelt on the problems or the difficulties that I've, that I've experienced, yes, it's very easy to do that. We can wallow around in our misery. But as I've told people, you just need to get busy, get doing something. Do something good. Do something positive. Help somebody out. Don't just sit around and wallow in your misery and just think about woe is me and suck your thumb. Do something positive and feed your soul, feed your spirit with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and give thanks. Because Paul said, I believe it's uh, the verse before this, where it says that in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, in everything give thanks. And in Psalm 100 it said uh, that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That's how we're to, to get through the darkness in our lives is by overcoming darkness with the light. To overcome darkness with the light. So put on those CDs, those worship CDs. Start making music or making melody in your heart to the Lord. Quote the scriptures. Quote those songs that minister to you. And give thanks to the God, to God for everything. Give not because uh, what you're going through is, is uh, pleasant or easy, but knowing that it is preparing you for what is ahead. 
A good soldier has to be trained how to endure hardship. And so, like I said, we don't need to be wimps and cave in, you know, to whatever happens to us. So we'll end our session here, but I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage all of us. We all go through those dark times in our lives. We all can face times where we can become depressed if we dwell on it. But remember what David did in the midst of the time when he was weeping and his men were weeping because their wives and their children and all their possessions had been stolen. It said that David encouraged himself in the Lord. You can't depend on somebody else to encourage you. You have to do it for yourself. So I pray that you would be encouraged. I pray that this is love. Love. This is love. Love is patient. Love knows how to endure. Love knows how to endure the hardships, the difficulties. You can't love if you're just going to bail out when things get hard. You have to be committed to it. And you have to learn how, you have to train yourself how to endure the hardship in life. So, Father, I ask your blessings upon each and every one, and I pray that this will encourage each and every one of us as we go through the difficulties in our lives, that we can endure the hardships, not think that there's something strange that is happening to us and why is it happening to me, but to know that when this is all said and done, we're going to be stronger people. We're going to be more mature when it's all over. That it's going to, as my salesman, um, sales manager would say, I just want to make you tough. Well, we have to have tough love. Tough love. Love that will endure. Love that will be patient. So thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name and we worship you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.